The diversity of life is fascinating, and it is a huge challenge to decipher its principles. How do species arise? For example, different beetles like these. And how is it possible that from a single cell, an egg, a complex organism can develop? Which mechanisms play a role in the determination of form? Charles Darwin was fascinated by the diversity of forms in nature, but he did not know the molecular mechanisms. The zoologist Ralph Zommer and his team at the Max Planck Institute for Developmental Biology in Tübingen are on the trail of evolution and development. I am fascinated by one of the most exciting phenomena that exists in nature, namely diversity. In animals, plants and fungi, we find an endless variety of forms, and I want to understand how this diversity of forms arises. Ralph Zommer is investigating how an entire organism is formed from a single egg cell, and where in this process evolution can take place. If there are changes in the processes during this critical phase, new species can evolve. Ralph Zommer has chosen a relatively uncomplicated creature for this work. Pristionchus pacificus is a nematode, or roundworm, that is just one millimeter long. It doesn't look very spectacular at first sight, but scientists really know every single cell of this creature. The nematode, Pristionchus pacificus, lives necromenically. The worms remain in the beetles until the beetles die. Then they feed on the bacteria which colonize the rotting beetle as it decays. But if there is too much competition for the bacteria, they will attack other worms and suck them dry. An evolutionary innovation makes this possible. Teeth. Innovations have always fascinated evolutionary biologists. Where do they come from? And what are they based on? What are the underlying molecular processes for an innovation of this kind to develop? How does developmental biology enable it to be incorporated into an existing animal? And what are the consequences for a creature which suddenly has teeth and can therefore start eating other roundworms? Pristionchus is particularly useful if we want to find all that out because its teeth are not only new, they also come in two different versions. Large with wide mouth, and small with narrow mouth. Which teeth the worm will eventually have depends on its environment. If during the worm's development there is sufficient food, that is bacteria, it will form a narrow mouth with small teeth. On the other hand, if there is a shortage of food or the population pressure is too great so that there is competition from other worms, then almost all worms will have a broad mouth and large teeth. The phenotypic plasticity could be not only an important ability to adapt to a changing environment, but is possibly also a mechanism on the way to new characteristics and ultimately to new species. So at the moment we imagine that if a creature is able to develop two different forms and develops a particular form under certain environmental conditions, that it can then experiment much more with the second form, so that it changes much more radically. That can happen perhaps over a few thousand years. And then, in the medium term, it is also possible that this new experimental form will suddenly become fixed and is present in the ecosystem as an evolutionary innovation. The scientists have already deciphered the molecular signaling pathway for these different structures. The molecular signaling cascade functions as in a game of football. Fallback, the pheromone from the larva. Centerback, the hormone dathachronic acid, or DA for short. In midfield, the receptor DAF12. And the playmaker, UT1, the enzyme. The fullback, the pheromone, opens the game by passing the ball. The molecular signal to the centre-back, the hormone dafachronic acid. 
This DA hormone passes to the defensive midfield, to the receptor DAF12. From there, the ball comes to the real playmaker, the enzyme Ute1, a key figure in the game. This is because this playmaker decides whether he will play the ball straight to the point or over the sides. These decisions are determined by the opponent's game. That means by the environmental conditions. In nature, this is where the decision is made as to which development path and which form will be chosen. A broad mouth with two teeth or a narrow mouth with one tooth. The scientists were surprised to discover that they already knew this signaling pathway from a completely different context that has nothing to do with teeth, but rather with the development of the larval stage. This is a typical case for co-option. We find this very often in nature, that something that already exists is used differently in another context. It's a very clever idea which nature uses very frequently. It's a bit like football. There, in the middle of the game, you suddenly change the tactics, and a player who had originally been a defender is moved to the front as a forward because you're losing, in the hope that he will then shoot the decisive equalizing goal. And we see the same thing happening in nature too. Old structures, old genes, old cells are used in a new way to make something new. In order to give a signaling cascade a new meaning, sometimes all it takes is to activate it at another point in time or with another concentration of messenger substances. And from this interplay, new structures can then arise, like, for example, the teeth of Pristionchus. In the meantime, Ralph Zommer and his team have described new species of nematodes from all over the world. Most of them live in beetles. And most of them have two teeth, or just one tooth. Some of them have none at all. The teeth are a model system which has allowed us to explain a great deal about which molecular mechanisms and which genetic mechanisms are important in order to produce something new. The teeth are a model system, just as the worm is also a model system. And the way the worm interacts with the beetle is another model system. And all that tells us really how nature functions. And then ultimately we are back to the original question, how does diversity arise? Diversity arises on all levels, in the molecular mechanisms of tooth formation, as well as in the interaction of worms with beetles. Darwin would no doubt be delighted. It's one of nature's clever moves, not inventing everything from scratch, but keeping things that have been tested and varying them in new way. And doing so until something new finally results. <laughs>